David, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to meet you. Yes, and I am excited to talk about Caro. Uh, we had a little demo before we started recording, which was great to see kind of the inner workings and the progress you've made with Caro. But I always like to start with, you know, for people who aren't familiar, what is Caro? Just kind of an overview. I'd love to hear that first. Well, Caro is really um, sort of thinking about what happened when, when COVID hit. If you, uh, There was a lot of uh, brick and mortar retailers just literally closed their doors and returned a lot of their stock and, and uh, online you know, you had to, to really, really light up at that point and work out how you were going to, to uh, survive and grow. And so we were looking at the brands that were using our platform at that time. And we had so many at this point, we have over 30,000 brands that we started to think to ourselves, look, there's a lot of a lot of traffic hitting the edge. If you look at this group of brands as a network, there's a lot of traffic there. Can we help them work together? Is there any way, you know, we came up with this tagline, sell more together. And so the idea was very simple is, you know, let's say you have a bicycle store and I sell helmets. Well, why aren't you selling helmets? Currently, everyone that buys your bike is probably going to Amazon to buy a helmet. Why don't you have, you really don't want that sale in your cart. Um, we have tons of helmet companies. Let us, let us give you um, some, some choices. And of course, they already had a brand that they liked. They can invite them into our network if it's somebody that's not already there. And boom, they've got helmets in their store. So what we're actually doing is we're, we're, we're taking the data from one company and, and putting it into another company's store. And so, and so now you can have an, almost an infinite amount of products without actually having to make the products and take all of the risk and fill a warehouse and have all the freight charges and everything else that goes with it. So the idea was really just to optimize um, e-commerce based on, on, on working together. Um, our latest tagline is stop selling alone. It is stunning how many people are out there just, just trying so hard to sell their one product, but the whole business gets more efficient when you actually add some extra things into the cart. Um, so you'll see that, that that's really the core of what we do. Absolutely. And I have a, a background of being in e-commerce for a few years at a company. And, you know, we saw all the challenges that are, go along with e-commerce and inventory and warehousing and all the different stuff that kind of goes into that, which uh, can be a lot for, for companies. And there is a need for this, but I'm thinking right away when you, know, you hear, hear of Caro, what you're doing, when you had this idea, what were you seeing in the market already at the time? You know, when you're doing some research around this or talking to customers, did this thing not exist yet? Or like, what was at the time when you started this? Like, what was there kind of currently available or, you know, that you thought you had an in with Caro? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually from the video game industry. I was there for like 30 years. Sony PlayStation bought um, the last company that I was one of the founders at. And um, I thought I was going to retire and I, I got myself like this cool man cave and I built a photo studio and I was taking pictures. And then I realized nobody cares about my pictures. And so um, then I found that if I took a picture of, a, of an influencer from social media, then boom, everyone cared about my pictures. And so it meant I was spending time with influencers. And, uh, and I started to realize that there's a bit of a breakdown. They never get to seem to work with the brands they want to work with. They're always working with just random brands that keep trying to tell they, people seem to think influences are billboards, but they're not billboards, they're brands. And so I, I sort of realized this and I started getting very interested in it. And I and I've been helping at that time um, students, uh, entrepreneurial students and, and as an investor. So I would come in and give them advice as an investor. Um, but I met this entrepreneur, his name's James uh, Jason Goldberg, and Jason was in the room helping from the other side. So he was the entrepreneur and I'm the investor and he's got this idea and he's presenting it and the kids are all involved saying what they would do. And um, it forced me to really look at what he was doing and he was building an app at the time to help influencers work with brands. And you can imagine this is very interesting to me. So we end <laughs> yep. up having a conversation and he said, look, why don't you become CEO and, and, and we'll, really, we'll really do this. So instead of trying to build it overseas, which is the normal way you would do it, we, we, we built a team in the US. Um, and, and so that, that was the path we took was this sort of authentic relationship between influencers and brands. Um, but what we realized quite quickly is if you can get the brands first, then the influencers uh, really want to work with those people. <laughs> and so we, we ended up having to sort of, sort of turn it around a little bit and go the other direction. But, um, but that's worked really well for us. And, and obviously brands are very excited to use that. That's a perfect segue to what I want to talk about with the brands. Tell, take me through that in terms of how you were approaching which brands you wanted to work with, the types of brands you wanted to work with. I know you mentioned like 30,000 like brands are on the platform. It's huge. 
how did you approach that in the beginning and how did that kind of evolve over time to you know gain that growth in terms of the brand side of things? Well, what's interesting, uh, it is really hard to get brands to, to um, the, the shields are up. Like if you go reaching out to them on, on LinkedIn or something, you'll find the shields are just up. And so it's quite hard to get to those people. But what we did is we would, um, we, we used some tricks. I mean, basically, uh, you know, you, you, you say, well, who's the head of e-commerce at a brand? Well, that person's generally a normal human. They're not an influencer. <laughs> they got 200 friends. They don't get many messages on Instagram. If you yeah. send them a message, they can't unread that message. They can't, they can't, now they know. And, and the response is like, that's possible. I didn't know you could do this. Uh, and, yeah. and boom, suddenly we're, we have a conversation. Um, what happens is it's common that they'll bring brands with them. And so we see plenty of brands bring in 10, 12, 14 other brands. And so you start getting that viral growth. We're, what's really kind of crazy is we're at, we're at over 30,000 brands and we actually haven't done our first press release yet. We've written it. It's in process. It's getting approvals right now, but it actually hasn't hit. So we and, and, and our branding, we haven't actually done our final branding yet for our company. We, everything you see, we just built internally, um, yeah. but we have an agency right now working on proper branding. So it's been kind of crazy, but that's that's the fun part is, uh, you know, if you offer them something that that they uh, they get excited about then then it just starts catching yeah and one of the things i just quickly want to go back to because i just can't gloss over this point of you going from you know successful exits of other companies to starting you know back in the startup game again for other people you know thinking about a new project thinking about a different company to join any factors that were helpful along the way for that in terms of you know joining you know, starting this new venture joining with the jason like anything that was helpful on the way that you were thinking through that was like yes let's go through this and start this again because it's a huge journey to start another company uh and especially for people who are starting for the first time just any insights you have on that david i'd love to hear yeah i've had um i've had multiple exits actually i've sold multiple companies um i once did um uh, the matrix video games um, uh, um and that company was acquired by atari as well and when you go through these processes, what you sort of learn is you start really respecting the job of investors. It's not, uh, I can't tell you how many people are like, okay, I got, I got like five ideas. And it's like, that's not what they want to hear. They want to hear <laughs> one idea, like you're all in on one idea. And, yep. and, uh, and then they're like, yeah, but you know, I, I can't start until they give me the money. And it's like, well, that's not going to work. Like that's not, that's not what they do. They're looking it's funny because when you think about what investors actually do, it's their job to protect money and to make money from it. It is not to just give money to ideas or to, um, I remember once Benchmark Capital invested into um, my last company and, the, and uh, the partner there said to me, you know, we don't invest in education. Like we're not, we're not, we're not giving you money to go educate yourself on whether you've got a good idea or not. That's not the business they're in. And yeah. so you'd be stunned how many entrepreneurs think that that's how this all works. And, uh, and so how do you take away the risk? And that's usually what, once you start taking the risk away, like in this case, Jason had already done so much legwork that, and I had spent my time with influencers. And there was this guy at the time, his name was Casey Neistat, um, who was a big oh, guy on YouTube. Huge and him. and um, Casey was once at an airport and someone pointed at Casey and said, that's Casey Neistat. And the airline, uh, it was Emirates Airlines, they up, uh, they upgraded him to first class. And he, he then shot a video of him flying on this ridiculously expensive <laughs> flight. He was taking a shower. And, yeah. uh, and, and he ended up with, um, I think that the total views of the videos he made for Emirates combined was like 190 million views or something like that. And so you sort of look at the math of that and you go, that's, that's remarkable marketing, right? <laughs> um, and what did it take? It took one person to point at him. And so that was one of the things that got, that, that made me feel really excited about this was, what if we did that at scale? Like, what if we did that for every brand? Like, like we said, this is important. This person's really important. That person, you've got to take care of that person. Um, and that's what we do. And so we've done that over 7 million times now for brands. And, um, and that's why, um, I got very excited about the potential of this and the scale. It's global as well, of course. Yeah, and I've, I've definitely, yeah, because a big Casey Neistat fan. I followed him for a while. I think a lot of people have, obviously. He's, he's massive. And just to see that video, yeah, that's, it blew up right away. It had tens of millions of views. We're like, 
pretty quickly across all different platforms. Uh, with that too, so coming back to then Carl, you decided to obviously join. Carl, great idea. You love what, what you guys are doing there. What have been the challenges along the way? So you have a lot of brands you started with, you got on the platform. Then you're going to go brands first, then influencers. But what's been the struggle, the challenge along the way with kind of building Carl so far? One thing I talk a, a lot when I when I give speeches to entrepreneurs is, is always um, think about friction. And friction is every single second. And, and, and arguably, it's getting to the point where it's every fraction of a second now. It's every single click. Um, and, and I know they know that, but they really need to understand that because they can disrupt anything they choose. There's nothing that you can't make easier, right? Every, I mean, if you think about the iPhone or something, did that, is that... Did that sort of improve the, the relationship with being able to get stuff done on your phones? Um, it was unbelievable. And, and, and if you think about it, like buying a car, I still can't believe the pain and suffering to buy a car, <laughs> all these forms and all this nonsense. And, yeah. and it's like you could disrupt any of these spaces just by making it easier. And so that's a core thing. So what happens is we come along and we say, well, we're going to make this easier. And we do. But you know what? We still haven't made it easy enough. And that's a never ending. Like I actually am now, I kid you not, we're starter conversations with what's the zero click solution, right? <laughs> Is there a zero click way to do this? Because I'll tell you, how, how well did Amazon do when they invented one click shopping, right? It, it, yeah. it, it fundamentally changed the whole concept of, of how much pain we were willing to, to, to take. YouTube came along but before YouTube, you had to actually install video drivers. Like you would install, you know, uh, a video drivers, DivX and things like that on your computer <laughs> so you could see video. It's insane. And, and, and so anytime someone comes along and just fundamentally makes it easier, that could be very disruptive in itself. And so that's something that we're looking at constantly. And what we're finding is that, that uh, brands, retailers, these people have no spare time. They're literally making decisions at the airport when the flight's about to leave, right? They're, they're <laughs> still just trying to get the things done they need to get done. And it's so funny how many companies are like, well, here's something. Can you please go and research that? And they, they have no time for that. They're not going to compare five different software packages. When do they have time to do that? So, so generally, um, as long as you understand that in just about every industry, no one has time, um, you can you can have a lot of fun. You can really shake things up. And so that's definitely one that if I was younger and I was able to do more businesses, uh, you know, over time, that's I mean, I just would be looking constantly for how can I go in and just cause craziness. Um, the, the last company was cloud gaming. So the idea was just to, to, to get rid of consoles. Sony yeah. bought the company and then built it into the PlayStation. Um, and, and, you know, someday there will not, need, you will not need the console. You just know that's coming. But if you start working that direction, um, usually that puts you in, in an interesting place that people start paying attention. So that's just the way I, I usually think about things. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, people, I mean, if you don't know, you sold it for a lot of money, 380 million is what it said online and 47 million was your other company. So obviously massive exits for those ones. Knowing that, so from those experiences and taking, you know, massive successes there into this company, like what are your expectations for what you want this to become, what you want Carl to become, you know, how are you going to build this, anything different that now you know from having had a couple exits? I'm curious about that. Well, yes, there's this thing that I call the X factor. I remember um, on our last company, we did a deal with Walmart so that you could stream video games um, um, from walmart.com and then the minute Best Buy saw that running, they're like, we want that, and they signed their contract. <laughs> so then the X factor to me is, do you think we can get Target? If we've already got Walmart and we've already got Best Buy, uh, and, and investors will go, yep, I believe you can get Target. We didn't get Target, never even talked to Target, but I get the credit for having Target. And, and that's the way um, true scaling companies operate is you, you have to prove a pattern of it works, but you don't actually have to get all those deals done for someone to believe you. You have to prove that it's there, people want it, and then they'll give you the benefit of, of the scale that can come from that. And um, if you think about the scale of this, and, and the, uh, I mean, I showed you our actual data so you can see yeah. all the connections that have formed already. Um, you know, what I would call pre-marketing um, is unbelievable. And so I see huge global potential for this. We have a lot of work to do because we have to support all the currencies and all the, 
you know, all the, the, the sort of tax laws globally. But we have some really interesting investors we'll be announcing shortly that, that are going to help with that. Um, and so, you know, scaling to, to that sort of massive global size, what is the value of that company? And I, I, I'll give you an example is, is Walmart, I heard, has 120,000 suppliers. Um, I think that's the latest data from them. Um, and, you know, we can get to that. That's not, that's not <laughs> yep. crazy, right? We can get to 120,000 suppliers. So what does that mean? Like when you, when you start, what, what when we have more suppliers than Walmart? Um, and so large uh, competitors of Walmart have invested. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the potential of this globally. And that's why, that's why I decided to jump in because I, I think this is a very, very uh, big space. It's e-commerce. It's a, it's like a trillion plus dollar space. It's <laughs> not, uh, you know, video games are huge. So, you know, but, but they're not as big as e-commerce. Um, yeah, e and when you take e-commerce and combine it with social media, because the future is the two merging, um, that's going to be even more crazy. With that too, so you mentioned the investor side, but just even thinking of that for you know your business and seeing the potential, it do you see it as like winner take all market? You have to raise as much as possible to get to this point of gain to that that growth you mentioned, or how are you just viewing you know fundamentally the fundraising side of this with this business after you know you started a little while ago and and now you've seen those growth numbers, you've seen the number of people in the platform. How are you thinking through fundraising with Cara? Well, um, it's it's actually quite a. Uh, we've raised over 30 million at this point, um, but in the process, you, you kind of you want to take the least amount that you can to execute what you're doing, obviously, to, so you get the least dilution for you and your investors. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you have to get on with it. Like you can't sit <laughs> around. People people are happy to clone these days, and they're they're going to do their best. And uh, and so your goal is to just get on with it and, and keep building. Um, we have, like I showed you some of the 3D graphics and things that we have, we have, we have video game engineers on our team um, as well, which gives us just this different, we just think a little differently um, than, a, than a normal business environment where, where they would be like, that's impossible. Um, it's not impossible when you bring in people that are used to pushing a lot of data. Um, and so the, the, the future is more actually data driven. And, and, and what that means is, you might see a surfboard you like or a, a snowboard or something that you think is really cool, but we can say to you, hold on a sec, that's the worst selling snowboard on the entire market right now. Uh, here, uh, this is the best. And so because we know what's going on on social media as well as knowing what's going on in retail and the, com the, the, the combination to, to give the highest converting things is very, very valuable. And so this whole, the fact that we came in through social media turns out to be an incredible asset of ours. Uh, an example of that is when you're trying to work out how to pair two, two brands together, uh, one of the secrets that we do is we, we look at, at the, the, the sort of fingerprint of that brand socially um, and compare it to this one. And these brands have never met before, but it turns out they have really similar um, um, influencers, et cetera. And when you put them together, they're like, wow, this brand's really cool. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, they're just like yours, right? And, and, exactly. and, and um, and so you can use data in very innovative ways, um, especially with machine learning and things like that. So um, as part of the network, the goal, again, is just to help the brands grow. The one thing I want to be clear is Cairo is not competing with the brand. So, so Amazon is constantly making private labels and competing with uh, the brands in, in, on their platform. We will not be doing that. So our goal is simply to help them grow. And if they grow, then, you know, all the boats lift together. What went into that decision of like not having competing brands? Um, we have absolutely no interest at all in in uh, in making product and and, uh, and you know trying to trying to manufacture products, etc. Have no interest in that at all. Um, we're actually more interested in helping the brands ultimately achieve their objectives, which would be acquisition or funding. So you're you know the the, the areas you're going to see us move into are more helping them get investment and funding because we've helped them grow. So if we help them grow, we'll vouch for them and say, look, this company's going crazy. Um, they don't even have to type a PowerPoint deck at that point, right? Because they are literally, the, the, it's, it's all in data. This company's killing it. 
Um, and so we would we would try to help um, get them acquired or, or get investment. So overall, I think that the, the, the sort of the health of the network is 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 entirely based on us um, focusing all our energy on growth. Um, and there's no brand, there's no brand in the world that isn't interested in that. They want two things, attention, growth, and then, oh, yeah. so, uh, you know, funding or sale um, is fascinating to them long term. Yeah, that actually, yeah, a lot of ideas come up with that in terms of you mentioning, if you're focusing on that side of things, then you have all the data on all these companies. Like, are you going to make direct investments? So you're going to, I mean, what, what kind of things are you thinking of that you can share that, you know, I don't know what you can or can't share, but uh, on that side of things, because they'd imagine then having all those metrics and stuff. Like I think of just, for instance, I interviewed um, Austin Allred from Lambda School and he does a lot of angel investing. And that reason being, he, know who, he knows exactly who's hiring so many engineers, like who's hiring a lot of engineers, you can invest into those companies. Is that something you guys think about too? Like, how do you think about that? With, Same thing. Uh, we have, we've yeah. already have investors saying to us, do you know which brands are most, he most healthy and in any category? And we say, of course we do. And, that, yeah. and they're like, well, is there any way we could invest? And we just have to create the bridge. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and some brands are going to be like, that would be amazing. And that, and that's just another killer feature that we can add to our platform. Yeah, it becomes really interesting. And one thing that you talked about before, I want to double click on is you mentioned you think you think differently at Caro, and you have these gaming engineers as well. What other ways are you doing things a little bit differently at Caro, maybe from other startups or things that you've kind of seen in the past? I think one of the things to do is always listen to the to the the people you're working with. They're and your employees. We had this um, thing last Friday where we just we had them all. There's this um, software called Figma that allows you to sort of yep. you can have this sort of fig jam thing where everyone's typing together into a sheet. And so we had all these brains pointed the same direction, and just to see the amount of ideas that came out of those people um, as they're actually. Um, you know, they're just thinking about what would be uh, amazing things that we could do for brands. And and so the the space itself has an almost unlimited amount of, of room for movement. I mean, we came up with years worth of, of ideas in one call. Um, but um, if you listen to the brands there, they've always got ideas too and things that they're seeking and wanting. And, and, and as long as you're listening, um, then, you know, I, our point is like, this is almost... Your development team, when I talk to a brand, I, I literally say that then we have a whole team of engineers. Just if you have an idea, if there's something that you think that would be amazing, then tell us, please don't hold that. I, I yeah. actually say to them, please don't keep it to yourself, right? We will, we will, uh, we can set engineers on that and, um, and off we go. But, but what I do see is us starting to think about um, with so many brands, we actually start to get some negotiation par. And, um, and that's one that we've been getting asked for quite a bit. Is there any way we can get um, shipping costs down? And so my answer to that is, well, yes, if we can get more brands in, if I get to 100,000 brands, uh, you know, you can bet I'm going to be knocking on UPS's door and <laughs> saying, you know, let's talk. Let's see if we can get yeah. the cost down for all these people. And so that's another fun future thing is this idea of, of, of the network um, uh, sort of providing its own leverage to help the network. And so... Um, and one last thing that I think would be really cool is just to get more time with the, the brands helping each other. And so we've been, we've been putting a lot of thought into, into how to do that because there's always people in your, in your network that are really smart, that, that are willing to share. You just got to find a way to allow them to do it. So that's something we're working on as well. With that too, with these different brands you have in, you know, your platform, working with everything, you kind of matching them. What is there in terms of community how you're building community them engaging with each other or is there a, is that a, that a factor and an aspect of, of what you're doing as well yeah so that's that's a key piece of of the the sort of strategy for 2022 um is to literally get more face time between brands influencers um celebrities and investors um, <laughs> to get them all uh you know interacting with each other in uh, in interesting ways and um, the, it's kind of required because sometimes to work with a brand, it's important that you actually kind of meet them and see their products and touch them and have that conversation. And so, the, um, yeah. you'll be seeing us put a quite a lot of energy into, into making that as seamless as it can be again, as effortless as it can be as well. Yeah. 
I think the community part is really interesting. We we thought about a lot about community at Vitalize, so our venture firm, and we launched our angel community um, you know, a month or so ago publicly, beta launched it maybe three or four months ago now. And knowing how we can have these early stage investments that are pre-seed, where we have a fund at seed, we can have all these, you know, angels that are both accredited and non-accredited because we're using leveraging crowdfunding, but then have these early stage companies that we normally just have to pass off and not do anything with. Then we have this community we can invest in at the earliest stages and then invest in those best companies too then in the, in the seed round so you're building a community around this and then entrepreneurs can get involved earlier with the vitalized brand it's like i think you're seeing companies all across different spectrums whether it be venture firms like uh even like hustle fund as angel community first round capital has like an angel investing community and then other other brands and like e-commerce or whatever that are trying to do a community because they see the value of that and how you actually know the stakeholders and know the people involved. And that, that gives your, your your moat with your company as well moving forward, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and so we think about that all the time, hiring hiring a community person now with us at Vitalize 2 and how we kind of leverage that to grow. Yeah. Important. Um, another one is Republic. Have you seen Republic? Um, yeah. They, they've, they've done quite a good job of getting um, a lot of, they can create quite a groundswell of interest around something new if it's cool. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I have a friend who raised like $11 million on there. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's a real platform. Like that's real. Yeah. Um, it's pretty impressive. A previous uh, guy that I worked with is the CEO of start engine, which is a Los Angeles based one. And that's another yeah. really cool one. So, um, yeah, I enjoy seeing these, these, uh, groups come together and then exactly as you say, the more that they turn that into a community, um, that, where they're all helping each other, the more valuable it becomes. Yeah. And sh shout out to WeFunder who's helping us along the way. I got to give that shout out. They're great. Yeah. We've worked with them for this whole process. There's been a lot of back and forth with it to figure it out because we're, you know, to get the crowdfunding side of it so we can allow non accredits has uh, been interesting. And one of the things you talked about with this, I know we, we talked about before the interview started, but you showed me kind of the different geographies and locations. You have all these different brands and everything. How are you thinking through that in terms of leveraging other countries or certain markets you want to get into with these brands? Or like, how are you thinking through that side of things too with this? What happens is what I learned from the game industry is if you add five languages, you double your sales. And so that's, you know, it's very easy to build just for the United States. It's just so easy to, to just focus on that. But once you start thinking about the other countries in Europe and building for them, um, you, you can double your sales. And then Asia is just another whole lift on top of that. So that, that becomes almost a guarantee. You can't you know, unless you can't do it for some reason, like it's just not technically possible, then you've got to think globally. And that's certainly what we do, as you can see by our, um, the way we present. It does get complicated um, when it gets into what we are actually offering, which is if you're an influencer, you could have your own store on Shopify and yet you could still do a deal with a brand that um, that's, you know, obviously not in your store that you might have never dealt with before but suddenly you're selling their product. But wait a minute, you could be in two different countries doing that. So one person is selling in one country and one person is supplying in another, another country, which means that you have, you know, you have to think about the finances of that and how, how the money transactions, tax reporting, all of that kind of stuff um, works. And so as a company, we're being, um, you know, again, the way we tend to work is when you get into these complicated things and that you bring in big guns you don't just sit there and try to solve it with the guys in the room you, you're like who are the big guns that we could bring in that would help with this and that's how we tend to work and 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 we love it when they invest because then they're all in so yeah. um so just know that's that's generally the way we think but you have to think globally if your company can be global it's not something you need to do day one but don't design your company in a way that it's going to be a nightmare to, to, to open it up to the world. And, um, and, and if you do, again, that makes it very hard for your competitors that are all, all just focused on the U S cause that was easy. Um, and when we were doing cloud gaming, if you think about that, that meant we had to have a ring of servers all around the world. And, um, yeah, that's what we got to do. <laughs> it's just, we got to solve for that. So right? solve it, yeah. yeah. You know, there's no, there are server racks in Tokyo. You can do it. Um, and so, but you have to accept that that's going to be part of your plan. David, what is it about entrepreneurship, starting these companies, whatever that you're addicted to? Cause you've had multiple now. It seems like, it seems like you just can't get away. What is it about it that it just pulls you in? The thing that, that I've found is, um, I have to be 
in charge in some way because then I can actually feel like I've got some hands on the steering wheel. If, yeah. I, if I'm way down and not able to get any control of the steering wheel and have no idea where we're going, that, that to me just doesn't work. Uh, and so um, I have this, this analogy that I use where you, you sort of look down a train track um, and you've got, uh, you know, the, the, the way my analogy goes is you're, there's a train on the track and that's your industry and everyone's on the train. So we're all on the train together going down the train track. There's people who miss the train. And uh, they're they're trying they're running down the track trying to get on on the train and be part of your industry, but there's also people that are trying to think ahead what's coming next. And so the task for an entrepreneur for me is how far can you look down a track? Um, you know, if that existed, then what? Don't just say you know what's that one additional step? What's the step after that? What's the step after that? What's the step after that? And once you look down that track as far as you possibly can. That's what you actually start working on, um, because whatever, when you're heading way down there, when other people are just you know sitting on on the train comfortably, um, you'll be seen as an innovator, and uh, and that's something that uh, you know if you if you've got great people that can actually start executing that, you'll see people will get excited. Like this is that's Elon Musk's every day. That's what that guy does every single day. He's looking way down the track, right? Yeah. Thinking, thinking, what can I do? And uh, and so, I think that's a fun, creative exercise for any entrepreneur. It's just, you know, sit down and have a think about that. I, I mean, and then think of a business, and then ask yourself, how could you, where, what, what would be the next step for that? Anything, Netflix, Amazon, anything, and start asking yourself, how would you, what would you do next? Where would that go next? And uh, I think it's a very, very healthy thing to do. Yeah, and that's that goes back to the uh, like. Charlie Munger and people were talking about, you know, mental models and looking at second order thinking is that exact point of like, what is that next thing? Not the first, the first order thinking, the second order thinking, where you're thinking beyond that. I think part of that goes back to what you mentioned of just having the time, spending the time, like literally spending the time to, to read, to research, to think about what could be after the next thing or the next thing uh, to get a feel for that, you know, and being on the, the VC side of things now, you know, we're always thinking about that on the investor side. You're like, well, what does this become? next so what if this happens what does it become you know you're thinking about the potential of these different ideas from the investor side you're really trying to think of those second order you know effects and we saw that with the pandemic people were a lot of people were guessing at what that might lead to in terms of second order effects of the pandemic and how that evolves businesses and how that changes industries and you look at industries like travel that were decimated during it but then a lot of companies are coming out of that that are interesting because there's different ways of going about that and we invest in future of work at vitalize so we're thinking about how that evolves with you know remote work or uh, distributed work or other things like that and trying to see what the next step looks like and then is it going to be people that want to go back to the office because they just missed that camaraderie in some way but like what does that look like and it's just fascinating to be in this industry and just talk to people like yourself to see what people are building next <laughs> well it's also important that you're interested right the fact is yeah. you could I, I could say nft to you and you go oh it's not interesting to me or you know <laughs> cr cryptocurrency oh that's just stupid i don't want to know anything about it that's terrible you need to you need to yeah. you need to be interested even it doesn't mean you have to go into every space i used to give speeches in, in um in the game industry and i would say who here has played pokemon and not all the hands would go up and I would be like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> you're in the game industry and you've never played Pokemon? This is terrible. Um, and so you kind of have to, I think, well, you don't have to, but it helps if you're interested in, in, in what's going on. Why? Because that helps you plan that all out and sort of think about how this, you know, if you're not, if, you're, if you never interact with influencers in any way, um, at some point that makes it harder to start work out what that space is and what their needs are and wants are and all the rest of it. So you have to just be interested. And that's, that's sort of, for me, the story of my life. I'm constantly, I'm, I'm literally learning Python right now between 11 PM and 12 PM at night, just before I go to sleep. Um, you know, just because you, you kind of need to know, uh, you know, what it does, how it works. I will do machine learning. I will get there, um, you know, because a lot of people are doing that on Python. And and it's just one of those things. It, do I need to? Absolutely not. Um, yeah. But will it make me a little bit more dangerous, like on a scale? It's like in a video game you have, you, you, you level up, it's plus one. You know, it's a plus one. Um, and so, you know, the more of those that you do and the more you find interesting, um, um, the better. And, I, and so I think that's a great, uh, a great DNA for entrepreneurs. 
Yeah, the, there's so much to go into that we could have talked forever, but I know we're almost out of time here basically. So one last thing I'm curious about is just with that 30 years of gaming experience, we've kind of already talked about a little bit how those past uh, companies have influenced you now, but on the gaming specific side, like how do you integrate that or are you integrating that in any way like into Caro or any other ways you want to talk about that? You're you know, having that 30 years of gaming knowledge into how you're building Caro today as we kind of close up things up today. Yeah, there's this concept of gamification and... Um... Uh, gamification is actually, I wrote a book on game design. It's like over a thousand pages, stupidly big book. Um, <laughs> and, and to save you wasting your time reading this ridiculously long book, it, it, it narrows uh, game down, games down to three things, which is skill, risk, and strategy. And in general, um, you start saying to yourself, well, what is an interface? And this is stuff I really want to get into in 2022 in our company is what is the interface doing to be compelling? So are you, in, in a way, with the data we're giving you, um, do you have any controls? Like, can I pull any levers? And, uh, and, and can I see the outputs? Now imagine I give you some control in the interface, but the output won't, won't, won't be reported for five days, right? Is that interactive? Is that fun? Um, you know what? When you, when you run ads on Facebook and Google, it's kind of like that. You, you put all your stuff in, you hit enter and nothing really happens. You don't suddenly like everything doesn't light up and you're, you know, you're not, it, it, you should, if I was designing that stuff, I would not want you to leave your seat. I would want you to literally like you put your, you, you know, you decide what you're going to spend, where you're going to spend it. And it should just be fascinating what you see in real time that makes you not want to leave your seat, but something that's easy enough for normal humans to be able to really um, uh, feel like they have some control of it. That's really what gamification is about for me. It's about, um, you know, making you feel like you, you have inputs. You, you're actually developing a strategy. Um, imagine there's the only input you have is one button click, right? <laughs> there's no strategy to that. So that's not fun. So that's not gamification. Um, I don't care what that button is. That's not, that's not going to get it done. But if you yeah. can get to a point where you have those three components, skill, risk, and strategy, um, skill just means you get better at it over time. You don't have to be great day one. Um, risk, if you take some risk, you get some reward. Um, you know, welcome to the advertising interfaces of Google and Facebook. Um, and strategy, well, that didn't work, but I think I worked out how I could do it a lot better. And, and you need to be able to do that in real time and change your strategy and see the results. Um, so that's, that's basically... Um, just a, a core piece of, of what gamification is, but there, there are other things too, but, but the core stuff is to make, to make it fun. Like, is this, is this, and, and make it interactive. So I, yeah. I, you can do that in many, many different um, businesses and software. It will be interesting to see how other, other companies can use that as well moving forward. And I know I have a number of friends from like my MBA program who are in gaming at different companies, um, building different games and, you know, seeing just a little of a glimpse of what they are building is interesting to see how they're, Increasing engagement, increasing every you know metric they're, they're measuring on that to, to help the game along, and that industry itself is fascinating. It's exploding. It's huge. So I, I, we'll see how other companies kind of leverage that as they think about it. And I, even like with community stuff, we go back to again just talking about like how we gamify that even like leaderboards on helping companies, leaderboards on educate. Like there's so many things we could do. That's exciting to think about too. Yeah, there's one that um, I was we've talked about internally is. Um, you know, a leaderboard's a great example. Is there any way to make it so that the person who's in charge of using your software can take the results of this data and get a pay raise? It's a, it's a, different, it's a different way of thinking about what are you giving them. You're giving, at the end of the day, this person is your champion or your hero in the company. So what are you yeah. doing for them? Like that you're always like, oh, I want, I want this for me and I want this. You know, it's easy to think about what your company desires. But this is your champion. So what can you do for your champion? How can you get it and make it easy for them to present their success? And, and you know, they did this. This is the impact they've had on, on uh, you know, your, your, your profit margins. Um, and, and they did this. And there's the evidence. Um, you see how that's a more interesting report for them than just some silly dashboard, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's just, there's a psychology to this stuff. And I think that... That's where I start to really enjoy it. We have the core platform, of course, but the really fun stuff is still to come, um, which is, is getting to play with all of those systems. David, this has been a lot of fun. What's the best way for people to learn more about Caro and potentially connect with you as well if they'd like to? 
yeah, if, if they're on Shopify, they should definitely at least try it. It costs nothing to try it. Um, and uh, the, the website is getcaro, C-A-R-R-O dot com. So getcaro dot com. And, um, and for me, um, the, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, it's, uh, you know, with it, my name is just D Perry on there. There's a lot of David Perry's in the world for some crazy reason. <laughs> I, once literally, I got invited to a David Perry party once. Um, <laughs> but if you go on LinkedIn, it's, it's in slash D Perry. And, you, and that's, that's, that's me. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Appreciate it. No, thank you so much. This is fun.